Hey, I'm Pastor Rod. Thanks for joining us today. I hope this message makes a difference for you. One of my biggest concerns about our society is open, all too often expressed hate. Sadly, the quickest way to gain a large following is to loudly express extreme opinions at the expense of others. It seems like there are areas where our nation has regressed instead of moving forward. Sixty years after the civil rights movement and the integration of Central High, tension between races still exists and in some cases is growing. Too many churches are segregated. There shouldn't be black churches and white churches. We should just be the church. All God's children worshiping together in peace and unity. It's not just racial tension. Our society is heading the wrong direction. All you have to do is watch the news or look around. Mass shootings at school and workplace. Millions addicted to opiates. Extreme angry politics. Church attendance down. Thousands of kids in foster care with little hope of placement. The polarization of our society. People rally around their extreme while ignoring the thoughts, feelings, and needs of others. Something needs to change. Somebody needs to do something. That's easy to say, isn't it? We can avoid responsibility and just add our loud voice to the noise by calling for action by someone somewhere. Well, in this series, I want to challenge you. What needs to change is us. Ranting and raving about everything wrong and everything that needs to change builds an audience, but it doesn't make a difference. At the end of all the shouting, things are still the same. Here's what I believe will make the difference. A heart change, not in them, but in us. We must allow the love of Jesus to penetrate our hearts in such a deep way that it changes the way we talk, the way we treat people, and even the way we interact on social media. We can and should bring unity and peace to a divided world. People watching us should say, there's something different about those people. I've got to find out what it is. I want what they have. The title of this series is, Every Soul Matters to God. I know you've heard me say it thousands of times. In fact, I've used that exact phrase now in 489 different messages. But I want to take a deeper look at what every soul matters to God really means. How does that truth impact your life? How should it impact your life? Let me start with a quick walkthrough of our church and its mission. Our goal is to develop lifelong followers of Jesus. The quickest way to evaluate a ministry plan or idea is to ask the question, does that help develop lifelong followers? Our goal is not to see how many people we can get to pray a prayer or make an in-the-moment decision. The prayer is important. The decision is vital. But it must lead to truly following Jesus. And we're in it for the long haul. From their first church experience in the nursery, our goal is to develop lifelong followers. People who love, share, serve, and follow Jesus their whole life. That's one big reason why we are a multi-generational church. It would be so much easier just to target one age group. But if the goal is for you to be a lifelong follower, equipping you doesn't stop when you turn 21 or 30 or 50, or 80. If you live for Jesus until age 80, and then you turn your back on him, you still miss heaven. So we are going to teach, challenge, confront, and develop, regardless of age or stage of life. Then in addition to our goal, we have a series of core values that guide our interactions with each other and the world around us. These core values are an agreed-upon standard of living and behaving that ensure we well represent Jesus and his love. Let's go through them real fast. The Bible is our guidebook for living. People have a lot of thoughts, ideas, and plans, but we measure our lives, words, actions, and attitudes 
by the unchanging standard of God's word. Resolve conflict biblically. One of the main reasons people stay away from church is that they witness unhealthy, dysfunctional gossip and fighting among so-called Christians. We are committed to Jesus' approach for conflict resolution. Go to the person you have a problem with and only them. Humbly and in love, after prayer, work through the issue together. If that doesn't work, involve a spiritual leader. Pulling anyone else into your conflict is a violation of Scripture. We must build healthy families. The family's under attack in America. We're committed to helping you be a better spouse, parent, grandparent, or child by learning what God's Word says about our relationships. We connect with God through worship and prayer. I don't want you to just know about God. I want you to know God. We connect with Him through prayer and worship, both together and individually. The next 40 days is going to be a powerful time of connecting with God and with each other. Everything's better in teams. We're better together. There is great joy in serving the Lord in community with other believers. We come together with all our differences, age, race, background, nationality, language, financial position, and together make a difference for the kingdom. It is a joy to serve the Lord together. And the very first core value we learned as a church is the one on which everything else hinges. Every soul matters to God. Every person everywhere matters to Him. That core value affects everything we do, and if you truly live by it, it affects everything you do. We're going to spend the next three weeks further exploring that core value together. What does every soul matter to God mean for you? What action is required based on that belief? How do you live out that value in every part of your life? At first glance, you might think, awesome, this could be an easy, feel-good three weeks. About time Pastor Rod gave us a break from all that challenging stuff and just let us be happy. (laughs) Not quite. (laughs) When we really look inside this value and what God's Word says, I think you're going to be both convicted and challenged to a new way of thinking and acting. Every soul matters to God. Let's slow it down, take one word at a time, and think about what the word every means. The dictionary definition of every is each, all, all possible. If we plug that definition into our core value, it would read each soul, every soul, all souls matter to God. Every soul matters to God is not just a tagline we came up with. It's biblical. 1 Timothy is a letter the Apostle Paul wrote to a young leader named Timothy who is leading the church in Ephesus. Paul wrote, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. Give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority, so we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. According to Paul, We are to pray for all people, and that includes all people in authority. Our president, our our state officials, our county, our city officials, our police officers, anyone in a position of authority. And Paul said, when you do that, when you pray for all people, God is pleased. Why? Because he wants everyone to be saved. Jesus gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Now, do you really believe that? I mean, we all know the right answer, but do you really believe Jesus gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone? What about the ISIS terrorist? What about Jeffrey Epstein and evil men like him who prey on young girls? What about James Crow, J. Calvin Jones, John Lester, Frank McCord, John B. Kennedy, and Richard Reed, who founded the Ku Klux Klan? 
Are there some people who are disqualified from the price Jesus paid? Are there some souls that no longer matter to God because of who they are and what they've done? The child molester? The drug dealer? The criminal who cons old people out of their money? The, the prejudiced racist? Do they matter? I mean, really, does every soul matter to God? Do you know who that includes? That includes the Democrats, the Republicans, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, people who disagree with you politically. That includes the person with whom you passionately disagree on an issue. That includes the people at the southern border trying to get into our country. Earlier this year, when we sent money to buy water and milk for babies at the border, that was questioned by some people in our church. What in the world has happened to us that we would actually argue about giving milk to babies? It is a common mistake. It's easy to forget that behind the issue of immigration, there are individuals, real people, souls. What about people walking in a gay pride parade? Did Jesus die for them? Do their souls matter? And you might say, wait a second, Rod, you're taking this too far. Am I? If we believe what Paul said, if we believe every soul matters to God, doesn't that have to affect our behavior? How we talk to and about people, how we treat people, even the stuff we post on social media. And all of a sudden, this core value is a little more difficult to deal with. See, it's not every soul like me matters to God. It's not every soul who does right matters to God. It's every soul matters to God. That is the biblical imperative. Now, just in case you think I took Paul's words out of context or that our core value is not sufficiently backed by Scripture, let me take you the words of Jesus. John chapter 3, one of the more familiar verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Just in case you're still not convinced, look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness, but he, thank God, is patient with us. Why? Because he does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. From Jesus to Paul to Peter and all through Scripture, it is clear the heartbeat of God is that anyone and everyone, regardless of their age, race, background, immigration status, past, their present, their political views, their criminal activity, their personal habits or detestable opinions, they're not only eligible for God's love, they are the objects of His love. They are the very reason Jesus gave his life on the cross. If that's the case, and it is, then every person must also be the object of our love. We have to learn to see people not as an opponent or an enemy, not as an object of ridicule and hate, but as an opportunity for God's love to be revealed. The person you dislike the most is the person God wants you to love. Now, is anyone perfect with this value? I mean, are there those who never react with human emotion, but at all situations, every time, see every person through the eyes of love? Probably not. I haven't met that person. Sadly, I'm not that person. The other day, I I was walking, and I realized something that I'm ashamed of. I'm prejudiced. I have an automatic, instant, deep, lasting dislike of prejudiced people. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but I'm prejudiced against prejudiced people. When I see a white supremacist or any type of person who makes a rational judgment about others based on their race, whether they're black or white, my reaction is very dismissive. I think they're stupid and probably evil. I don't want them around me. I don't want them in our church. I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to share with them. 
And you know what? That makes me like them. It's horrible. I'm angry at them for hating people based on who they are, and I'm doing the exact same thing to them. How my ugly, prejudiced attitude must hurt the heart of God. See, if you're a black person, you can't see through the lens of hate every time someone makes a racially insensitive comment. You don't have that option because when you do, you lower yourself to their level. Your response to every person must be love because that's how God responds to them. Instead of looking through the lens of your hate, you've got to learn to look through the lens of God's love. If you're a white person, You can't base your opinions of others based on their skin color or nationality. Your immediate reaction should not be a thought or words about those people, but instead a response to the love of God who includes black people and Latinos and Asians and Russians in his love. So here's how I've been praying. God, help me love people who don't demonstrate love. Help me love people who offend and anger me. Help me treat them not as objects of my hate, but as objects of your love. Forgive me for my ugly attitude that is unscriptural and contradicts your commands. Because Paul said, I urge you, first of all, pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. Give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all those in authority so we can live peaceful, quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth? For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. The man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. So let's take it down to our level. Real world, every day. Jesus gave his life to purchase the freedom of the server who brought you unsweet tea instead of sweet tea. Jesus gave his life for the person behind the counter at the DMV. Jesus gave his life for the teacher who doesn't recognize that your child is a genius who just needs a greater challenge. Jesus gave his life for the checkout person at Walmart. Or for that matter, the person in front of you who is slowly counting out pennies for their purchase. Jesus gave his life for the girl at Nukes who doesn't know how to work the register. Jesus gave his life for the guy who just cut you off in traffic. How many of them are you praying for? How many of them are you treating with dignity and love? sharing Jesus with. If you aren't doing that, then can you really say they matter to you? Next week, I'm going to talk about some practical ways that you can demonstrate that every soul matters. But I want to stop this week on the word every because this is a hard issue. The definition of prejudice is an unfavorable opinion or feeling formed beforehand or without knowledge, thought, or reason. At its root, prejudice is not an experience issue. That's the excuse too many people give, if you just knew my experience. It is not an experience issue. It is not about your background or your past hurts. It is a heart issue. We must allow the Lord to change the ugliness of our hearts to match the beauty of His. Every soul matters to God. The people who are like you and the people who are not like you at all. The people who agree with you and the people who disagree with you. The people you like and are drawn to and the people you can't stand to be around. I'm so glad Jesus didn't exclude anyone from his love. I'm thankful every soul was included on his death, in his death on the cross because that means I'm included. Salvation, forgiveness, mercy, and grace is extended to me. And you know you have grabbed hold of the heart of Jesus when you can stand and pray for those whose views are offensive to you and when you can truly love them. That's when the Lord can use you in a powerful way. My prayer is, Jesus, make our hearts like your heart.